This is John Van Newman. Hey, welcome. How yes, are you? Who are you? I'm Max Rampel. Yes. What can I do for you? Just wonder how you are now. I am much better, thank you. Uh-huh. So your exit, I think, was difficult, right? Your, uh, you didn't believe there will be something on the other side. No, it was hard to believe after everything that I saw that there was anything there. So how do you find the other side? Inspiring. So, I think it's... Uh-huh. I think that it is just what I needed. Uh-huh. So, um, what are you busy with? What do you do? There are so many new interesting things to look into. Space and time and many different elements of that. Just, uh -huh. being in ge just speaking in general, the physics of the universe is amazing and unpredictable at moments. And uh, learning how just things work, learning about uh, gravity and light and how they work together is also uh, fascinating to me. I just wonder... Uh... So Einstein is there, Feynman is there, Bohr is there. So they all uh, had their questions unanswered. I mean, they, they came to a certain point and their questions were unanswered. Do you guys know the answers now or you still have to look for them? We have found some of them, but remember this. God just doesn't hand you the information. He makes huh. you find it yourself. And I've had a lot of time to do that. So I am finding my own answers and I'm loving it. I'm listening now to a new book on quantum physics and- uh, Yeah. Um, yeah, my interest is biological basically. Uh, yeah. so somehow about the, the role of uh, quantum physics processes in DNA, quantum DNA. And it's, um, it looks like this is the key to, to life. How, yeah. the, how the uncertainty collapses, how the, how the life is just a series of uh, wave, wave function collapse. It is, yes. It's much more in depth than that, but it, that is a way to say it. You, you understand that there's so much that goes into all these things. And so just saying that that is uh, the answer uh, brings you a little short of the actual statistics. Ah. Um, Trying to bring through those thought processes to the other side here is uh, rather interesting in many ways. Uh -huh. I see that um, curiosity is helping move things along in your world, but they are still blocked by some thought processes and still blocked by the, the, the lack of knowledge about how energy works fully. Uh-huh. So just look into my research. Uh, I think the key question is to understand the language of the genome. We have the sequence. And you are a genius in understanding sequences and, and languages. You, I guess, you are the, the, the key authority in the world about languages. And the language of the genome is not yet unciphered, deciphered. Wow. We still have the, the letters, but we cannot read it. 
So right. help us reading it. Help us reading it. It's and the, the, <laughs> the key to, re to understanding what is written there is in your science of quantum physics. There is something about waves in, the, in that code. Yeah. Uh, my, one of my friends says that the genome is written in Hebrew. Uh, basically, you have to use the Hebrew alphabet and Hebrew uh, language to, to read the message of the genome. Maybe it's, maybe it's incorrect. Maybe it's uh, Sanskrit or, uh, or Mandarin, but uh, the idea that it is a language, it, it has to have certain sound and certain uh, vibration in it. Maybe that's that's the key to deciphering it. It it is a language. It is a mathematical language. So it's it, that is part of it. The you're talking about putting it into a a human language. It's it's a it's a hybrid language, and uh, it it stems from these different things from. Uh, Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and things of that nature, but that's not the the issue. The issue is it's more mathematical, and these letters are representative of actual numbers. Oh, wow. So that is where you need to find that each number... You can say that one and two equals three, but also two and one equals three, and one and one and one equals three, to be very simplistic about it. So you have to figure out each one of these as they are meant to be read so that you know what they are doing. Because one may have one function and one may have several. Uh huh. And so, knowing which has several functions and which has one function is the first um, bookmark, if you want to say. Yep, I agree. It's called redundancy. Yes, redundancy of the code is the key to understand it. Yes. And so that is your first bookmark. And I do not know how advanced your mind is. So that is where I had come back to. The next step is that once you see that they, that they have their own uh, redundancy, if you will, and how it works, then you have to calculate why it works. And the, that is where you are at now. You are looking for the different ways that it is carried out the different messages of the mathematics. Mm -hmm. The different messages of the mathematics can be uh, sent to many places, but always to the brain. Always to the brain via some vehicle. The mm -hmm. nervous system, the blood system, but in the nervous system or... Uh, the uh, DNA system uh -huh. and it is all things go to the brain and all things go to the parts of the brain that it functions with. Uh -huh. You have all these different portions of the brain that are dealing with different things and have their own priorities. Uh -huh. now, you may say, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? But it does have, it is the function to send to the brain the information by way of what the brain understands and can decipher is the meaning of this uh, code or language. Mm -hmm. So it sends each code or language or mathematical formula in a way that the brain can decide if it's movement, emotion, physical, nervous, whatever. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, it needs many different 
algorithms, so to speak. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And these algorithms can be slightly different and end up going to many different areas that you might not think of. Like, uh -huh. you, like the parietal lobe is for motion, arms and legs. That's its major function. But it has many other functions as well that all end up going to the frontal lobe and the amygdala because those, those areas uh, filter all the thought processes. Mm -hmm. And so the energies that are released as the, the mm, DNA is calculated and it calculates uh -huh. at a uh, an incredible speed, incredible speed. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Send these messages and look at your reactions. You can react instantly to certain things, heat and, and pain and different things. The, the security systems that are locked in the DNA are incredible. Uh-huh. And DNA is a hybrid of itself, meaning that it has taken on the personality of, of what it has created. Does that make sense? Right, yes, hybrid, yes, created, yes. Uh -huh. And so therefore, as it is a hybrid of itself in some ways, because it has doubled back, and is looking at itself in a different way now that it has created the the whole system it is a uh -huh. mirror of itself so that it might find all the right methods in which to make the body work in the perfect functionality that's a good note yes uh-huh so it the amygdala Mirror is a is a also a mirror of thought processes. These thought processes are so quick, instantaneous, if you will, that but they are checks on the computer system, which is the brain. And most of this everything goes through the frontal lobe. I'm I'm quite sure of that. And almost everything goes through the amygdala, except for um things that are non-intellectual. So, um, cognitive thought processes all do this. But there are some times where uh, the amygdala is a mirror for pain and for emotion as well, if it's necessary. Now, there are so many things to tell you, I don't even know where to start. It's just a matter of what. Ask me a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to bring uh, I'm trying to bring the quantum physics to the um, to that understanding. So the way the wave function collapse that somehow the DNA is alive and somehow it uh, it is thinking and processing the information and storing memory, retrieving memory through uh, quantum. Uh, granular processes so it has to go into delocalization and then collapse of the function so that's i think where it can contribute yes all right it it is that it is doing many things at once there's no question uh -huh. the dna uh -huh. the very fact that you are moving right now is the, is probably a thousand different functions all at once uh-huh and so when it collapses, it, it's reborn into a new thought process. But that can happen in a nanosecond. Of course. And so therefore, your new functionality all, takes life instantly and is brought about by wave forms, as you know. The chemical portion of it and the wave for, portion of it work together. They cannot be separated and they cannot work separately because mm -hmm. they are part of the same system and they have the, they speak the same language in many senses.
So mm-hmm. you're looking at um, two different things that communicate well together. Uh, how do I describe this? No. Nah. Mm. To put it in layman's terms is difficult. But you see where I'm going with that. Yes, uh, wave and chemicals um, interact. Basically, it's, but I'm talking about uh, delocalization, basically spread of the uh, uncertainty and then uh, collapse creating the certainty because it's very digital at certain point. Yes, it is. It's digital. And I was saying that it, it takes only a nanosecond for that to happen. But uh-huh. what is the question? Uh, maybe that's the key to uh, understanding the language. That is the key, yes. There's no question about that, right. And Let me ask you about your um, alien uh, origins. Uh, yeah. did, you, did your soul or the body have alien origins? I, had, I was an alien hybrid. Uh-huh. I came from a very mathematical place. Uh-huh. A- I actually had some AI influence uh-huh. because they wanted to see what uh, biological thought could do when affected by AI intelligence. Mm-hmm. So which race did that? Uh, that was the Orions. Right. Uh-huh. They experiment a lot with these kinds of things. And Are they so still I, around? I was an experiment, yes. Are they still around? Of course they are. Oh, tell me more. The, uh, the Orions are the ones that are more... Um, they are, they are the ones that built the pyramids or were the ones that designed them originally or thought of them as being part of Earth's scenario along with the obelisks. Are you talking about human Orions, human-looking Orions, or the blue avians? The blue avians and the Orion area. There is more than one species there. Mm. So which species was you? Which species species well, was you, were you? The blue avians did send me some information, yes. And there was another species of Orions that w- looked more like um well, they weren't humanoid, but they looked they could stand on two legs. And had arms. I saw them, but I wouldn't know how to characterize them. But they were the ones that did the AI intervention with me. Were you aware of your alien origins? Not then, no. Did you speak to the aliens? You know, I think I did. I wasn't sure who I was speaking to when I was speaking to these highly intelligent beings that look like humans. But you see, it was that they were probably aliens because they talked far above most of the other scientists. They had a greater understanding of of everything. So when was that? They did talk to me in my, in my, I had my own office. Uh-huh. And they would come to my office and saying that they were from the government. Uh-huh. But they would speak to me in a way that I had never been spoken to before. They spoke to me in um, almost mathematical terms all the time. They were very calculated. Uh Uh-huh. And I gained a a great bit of information from them, 
but the, when they left, I could never find what department they were from, or I could uh -huh. never see where they they had spoken to anyone else. I had their names, but they their these names never showed up on any list. Uh huh. So I questioned people about them, and they they had no idea, and they said they must be part of secret society or. Uh, you know, the Gestapo or something. Uh huh. So I was um, not sure who they really were, but I think that they were aliens. Uh huh. Yeah, at that time, I think there was pl plenty of uh, Orion aliens in the in the top layers of um, secret projects in, uh, in the military. Yeah. I wouldn't doubt that one bit. So I think also there was a lot of uh, alien hybrids among the physicists. You you communicated with a lot of great physicists, and uh, I think they all they all were very advanced. Yes, there was a few that seemed not quite human. Uh huh. But uh, I didn't say anything to anyone. So why why was it that uh, a lot of Hungarian Germans no, a lot of Hungarian Jews uh, were so talented. I mean, there is like just exceptional number of uh, Hungarian Jews. Well, how did it happen? Um, they have the right DNA for the job, meaning that it can be manipulated better. But, uh, you know, Hungarian Jews shouldn't be any different than any other Jews, like Polish Jews or Russian Jews. How did it happen that uh, precisely from right, Hungary came so many excellent physicists. They were in the right place at the right time. So there was no any, uh, uh, alien... There was uh, alien interaction, I'm sure. But you could not prove it by me by at that time. But uh -huh. I see now that I'm here that they did uh, go and work in that area. The aliens did have uh, some people that they worked on and made some very uh, promising physicists. Oh, so it was uh, planted in advance and then they somehow guided them? Correct. Wow. It is time that we go. Right, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Sorry, I, I took a little extra time. That's all right. Thank you very much. Nice to connect to you. And uh, yeah, please pay attention uh, to that DNA deciphering project. You are the perfect uh, talent to guide it. Thank you. Give us some support on that. I will. Thank you. Greetings. Greetings. Yeah. Hello. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. Did you have a welcome good session? Back.